several weeks ago, I gave a focus, and I talked about coming out of my house and a red bird that flew in front of me and landed on the bushes in front of my house, and how that really spoke to me about where I was at, at that moment. And after that focus, several people came up to me, and they talked to me about their experience, and they talked to me about the symbol of the red bird. Um, so I went back home, and I found that I had uh, a book on tape, on CD, of Paula de Arce's The Gift of the Red Bird. So I took it with me and I put it in my car and I listened to it as I drove you know, back and forth and it has really become for me a very powerful symbol and especially as I have journeyed into Lent, I've carried that, that symbolism and that understanding along with me. Well recently, I'd say in the past two weeks is what I would say, um, another red bird has come into my life. I don't know if it's the same one or a different one, but um, where the first one was such a, a symbol of peace to me and hope, this one is a, a different thing. It's, it's kind of a symbol of, of frustration um, because in the back of our house, this is not the front of our house, this is in the back of our house, we have a computer room and it's completely glassed in. It has glass on three sides and because the afternoon sun comes in and it's really bright and hot, um, we've put a reflective film on the outside of the windows. And the effect that that has is like a two-way mirror. So if you're standing on the inside, you can see clearly outside. But if you are on the outside trying to look in, what you see is a reflection of yourself. Um, so you know, if you look really hard, you could see inside. But it affords us a little bit of privacy and cuts down on the sun. Um, but you, you would see a reflection of yourself. <clears throat> Well, this red bird now sees itself, and I guess it thinks, you know, it's spring, it thinks it's another male bird, it's a competitor for its territory, so it, it comes, and every morning as the sun rises, it comes and it flies against the window, and it does this over and over, it does it for a long period of time. So, you know, having this powerful symbol in my life, I'm very upset that it's trying to do this. So we've developed this little rapport between the two of us. Every morning I come and I take my morning coffee and I stand on the back porch. And I watch the bird and I try to think of a way to communicate to it. How can I tell it that what it's doing is, is futile? That there's no competitor that's trying to compete, that it's his own reflection. Um, if I open the door and I step outside, well that startles him and he flies away but he only returns in a few minutes to do it again and again um, and sometimes I just stand on the other side of the window holding my coffee cup thinking that maybe my silhouette you know behind the window will make him aware that it's not his reflection uh, that it's not you know another bird maybe that will help um, and as I stand there every morning I am joined by my two cats one on either side and I have come to decide that their motive is different from mine. Because I'm trying very hard to communicate to the bird that it could fly free, that there's no reason to bang its head again and again and again against the window. And they're thinking up recipes for a um, red bird sandwich. So, and I've become aware of that. But they do stand next to me every morning and we have our own little, own little thing going. Um, eventually we go our separate ways. I have to move on to my morning and I, you know, I hope every day that I'll get up and, and things will be the same, but we repeat the same silent ritual every morning. And I wonder to myself, why doesn't the bird learn? Doesn't it hurt? Can't he see that it's only a reflection, it's not the real thing? And, and why doesn't he learn from his actions not to do the same futile thing day after day? Well, of course, as I reflected on this and I opened up and read the story of the golden calf, I couldn't help but see that there was um, kind of a connection to what happened with the Israelite people who grumbled again and again and turned their back on God, it seemed like, again and again. And don't I do the same thing again and again? How often do I bang my head against the same window thinking maybe this time it'll be different? Um, so we heard them say, just a couple of weeks ago, this is what we heard them say, we will do everything that the Lord has told us. All the Lord
Lord has said we will heed and do. Seems like a long time now since we heard them say those words. Um, at the base of Mount Sinai, they gathered together. They received the covenant. They participated in that ritual ratification of the covenant, and they shared a communal meal. You know, it seems like they've turned 180 degrees away from God. They've forgotten that he's the one, the one true God that led them out of slavery and safely to this place of worship. What is behind this total reversal and how could this have happened? Um, I thought our commentary really did a good um, thing in, in the way that it described this when he said, well, it happens all the time. Human beings find it hard to live in the realm of pure faith. After all that they had seen and experienced as one true God, they still fell to the temptation to be like those around them, to be like everyone else. God had made them a holy nation, a kingdom of priests and a people set apart, but they fell back into the ways of the culture that surrounded them and that they encountered on a daily basis. The Egyptians, the Canaanites, they fashioned an image out of gold with their own hands. We look upon their sin now as the sin of idolatry, and this is what the Catechism says about that. Man commits idolatry whenever he honors and reveres a creature in place of God. The emptiness of this type of God is referred to by quoting Psalm 115. Our lesson referred to this this week. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. These empty idols only make their worshipers empty. Those who make them are like them. So are all who trust in them. It is God, the living God, who gives us life and intervenes in history. The figure that they made was of a golden calf or probably more likely a young bull because that was a, a symbol in Near Eastern culture of, of strength and in some cultures of divine strength. Uh, the Israelites were familiar with this image because remember in um, Egypt they had all of those gods that they worshipped and one of the main deities that they worshipped uh, was that in the figure of a bull. And remember that was why they made the request in the first place to go out into the desert or to worship because it wouldn't have uh, it would have been inconceivable for them to sacrifice a bull in that Egyptian culture it would have been very disturbing to their captors uh, their Canaanite neighbors when they get to the promised land they will also use the bull as a symbol of divine power so they're kind of uh, caught in the crossroads between cultures and they see this as a symbol for um, divine strength uh, it'll pop up again and again in the history of the Hebrew people, banging their head against the same window over and over again. Did they intend to worship that bull as a deity for the calf to replace Yahweh? Is that, was that their real intention? Well, Moses had been gone for a long time, 40 days and 40 nights, a significant amount of time. Um, and after what they had witnessed on Sinai, you think back to the covenant, the ratification, um, the mountain covered by cloud of smoke and fire, uh, trembling at times as with an earthquake, thunder and lightning whenever God spoke. They may very well have figured that Moses had died. He was gone for such a long time. For these people, Moses was a visible sign of God in their midst. They had gotten used to him standing between them and God. They had come to associate Moses with Yahweh. With him gone, they started to look for a vis visible replacement for him. It was Moses they were trying to replace, not God. They still, in their minds, thought they were worshiping God, but they were missing Moses. It seems odd, really, that they didn't just turn to Aaron and say to him, won't you be our leader? You know, won't you replace Moses while he is gone? But that wasn't what they did. Instead, they said to him, can you make us a God that would be our leader? And I think it's kind of difficult for us to look at Aaron and say, well, why did he do that? Why didn't he just say, well, no? You know, but it, it, it's hard for us to understand exactly why. But maybe he thought Moses was dead. Maybe he thought, one commentary I read said that he thought maybe if he collected all the gold and took the time to mold the golden calf, that that would, you know, buy him time. And in that interim, maybe Moses would come back. I thought that was a little weak in thinking that, but possibly it was buying 
buying him time um, until Moses returned. Um, possibly his own pride got in the way. He did want to be the leader. And if this is what the people asked him to do, then that's what he would do. For whatever reason, he went along with their request and he molded and fashioned um, that bowl out of gold. This chapter is full of paradoxes, things that stand in direct contrast with each other. Um, and really the main thing that's evident in that is when we return to Moses on the mountain. We see all of this chaos down below. We see this fashioning of the bull and we see this, this seemingly turning away from God. But then we go back and we see Moses. For that 40 days and 40 nights, he's been in deep conversation with God. And, and his desire, the desire of his heart now is to come back and tell the people what God wants them to do. They've said whatever God wants of us, we'll do. So Moses wants to come down and tell them this is what God wants of you. This is the path that you should follow. But in contrast to that, Aaron, on the other hand, acts on his own initiative. He doesn't take the will of God and what God wants into account. Uh, the Navarre commentary on this passage quoted St. John of the Cross very beautifully. Faith and love will be the guides of the blind, which will lead you by a way you do not know to the hidden place of God. Love is the guide that directs it. Faith is like the feet which brings the soul to God. We must look to the love of God over and above our own human interests. The Catechism talks about ways that we can sin against the love of God, and among these are indifference, ingratitude, and lukewarmness. And I don't know about you, but I certainly have been guilty of all of these at different times in my life. As mentioned before, this people did not want to abandon the worship of Yahweh. That really wasn't their main intention. The bull that they formed was to serve as a sign of his presence among them. And archaeological evidence shows that it was a bull that was fashioned almost like a throne for God, maybe in their minds, that God would sit upon it or ride upon it. Um, but here again, another paradox, a great irony, because at the same time that they were building this supposed throne for God, God was describing to Moses in great detail how his sanctuary would look, this visible sign of the divine presence. He was describing his own throne or his own mercy seat that he would uh, be among them. The people had jumped the gun. They had forged in their own minds what this would look like, and they didn't unfortunately come up with, as we will study in, in weeks to come when we look at the sanctuary in the desert, they didn't come up with cherubim or heavenly beings, but they came up with an earthly creature, the figure of a bull. And this will happen again many years later down the road when the northern kingdom splits um, from the southern and, and the king of the north has to find another place for those people to worship because he doesn't want them going down into Jerusalem to worship at the temple. So what he does is he goes into the land of Dan and, and Bethel and he sets up altars there. And in setting up those altars, he doesn't build like the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubim on the top. Instead, he builds this same kind of structure with a bull on the top. So banging their heads again against the same window over and over again. As God breaks the news to Moses about what's happening down below the mountain, it's clear that he knows what punishment the Hebrew people deserve. God refers to them now when he talks to Moses as your people. Your people did this, not mine. He offers Moses the fulfillment of the promise that he had made to Abraham and to the patriarchs. You know, he said to Moses, well, I'll, I'll let that pass through you then because these people, you know, have turned their back. But Moses has left all of his own ambition behind him. The 40 years that he spent as a shepherd in Midian has taught him humility. So instead, he responds to this in such a beautiful way. He intercedes for the people. He reminds God of the covenant with the people, as well as way back with the patriarchs, with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Israel is the people that God has made his own. 
The promise, the election, and the covenant form the foundation which guarantees God's forgiveness even in the face of this gravest of all sins. Remember, this is a covenant, not a contract. It's not like they've broken off something that's a, um, just like a rental agreement between two people. This is a covenant. Just like we as a parent will forgive again and again our wayward children, we'll hope to instruct them and hope that their choices the next time will be different, but we will forgive them and welcome them back again and again. God forgives his people, and that's what he calls them in verse 14. He calls them again his people. But he forgives them not because they deserve it, but out of pure mercy and moved by Moses' intercession. What a powerful thing that is to understand what our intercession for other people can do. Later, when God reveals himself to Moses, Moses will refer to him as merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. God is a merciful God. He forgives his people. Well, Moses returns then to the bottom of the mountain, to the revelry of the people, and he destroys the tablets which God, on which God has written the law. He didn't just drop them, like in the, the film that we watched a few weeks ago. Um, he destroys them purposely. He throws them down. Imagine for over a month that he has been intimately in contact with God, and now can you imagine his response when he encountered the crude bull that was fashioned by the hands of the people. Uh, I read an account one time in the, the um, Herald, the Catholic Herald, uh, a writer called Dorothy Curran, who used to write. Um, she had spent a summer away. She had been in a very poor, poor area, and she had worked among people that just were in need of everything. And she came back from there after about three months of being away and being just completely immersed in this culture and completely immersed in what she was doing. And she came back to the United States and one of the first things she did, she decided she would buy her grandson a toy, like a water pistol or something, a water gun in the summer. So she went into a Toys R Us and she was absolutely aghast. She could not stay. She had to leave because the contrast between the two worlds was too stark in her mind. This overabundance of aisle after aisle of water guns as opposed to this culture she had just left that was in poverty and so desperate for just the basic things of life. Um, so that was kind of the image that flashed into my mind, him coming down after being immersed in God for 40 days and to see what the people had done. They had fashioned this bull out of their own hands. He then destroys the calf, this object that was made by human hands. The tablets of the law had been forged by the work of God. They were the work of God. He then grinds up the calf. He makes the people drink the gold dust in order to impress upon them that this symbol they thought of as a strength, this was going to be the strength of the Lord. It was powerlessness. The sacred image they had fashioned had for them no strength. Their strength was to come from the Lord and following his ways banging their heads against the same window over and over again. It's really easy for us now to look back on this so many years later and read it and say just like I do when I stand in the morning watching that red bird, why do they keep doing that? Why? Doesn't it hurt? But I know for myself that I'm guilty of doing the same thing. I return to the same actions time after time, thinking that maybe this time, if I do that same action, I'll receive different results. But that doesn't usually happen. What do I build as a throne in, in my life for the Lord? My possessions, reliance upon other people, uh, pursuit of selfish pleasure. I know one thing that I'm very guilty of, and I've got to say, when, when Joanne got up this morning and started to talk, I told her I just was amazed at how the Lord works and the words that she was saying because I'm busy. All the time I'm busy. I have too many things to do, too many irons in the fire, and I can justify it because, after all, I'm doing this for the Lord. And it doesn't really come to a head for me until I find somebody that steps in 
into my office and I look up at them and, and I say, what do you want? What are you doing? Leave me alone. I'm doing this for the Lord. And then I think, oh wait, maybe I've forgotten about his love for me and maybe I have forgotten about what the path looks like and I have followed my own path that I have forged with my own hands. Banging my head against the same window over and over again. Seeing, instead of the reality of God on the other side, a reflection of myself. Choosing to remain there at that window rather than to fly free. I want to encourage all of you because this Lent for me has been a chance to break the cycle. That symbol of the red bird that I'm carrying into my own Lenten journey has really tried to remind me daily to take the time to step aside, to find the silence and the peace even in the midst of the chaos. So may our prayer for each other today and during this Lenten season be that we give each other permission to seek the Lord in all all the places he can be found and not give in to temptations to fashion him a throne out of our own imagination. Why don't we go to prayer? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you have drawn us to yourself, you have drawn us individually, and you have drawn us together as a community too. You love us so much and you want so badly for us to follow in your path. I just pray that you bind us together as a community of love for each other and you help us to encourage each other to seek you first, to find you and to spend that time in silence and prayer and in quiet, wherever we can find it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.